Well, I, I, we just heard, thank you, Sophie. I just wanted to add uh, thank you, Sophie, also from my side, especially also for keeping an eye on the clock. Time isn't always on our side, but what a great panel again. And uh, a really insightful discussion there on premium and capital support. Of course, we have another panel waiting for you, another lever to scale up climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions, this time focusing on public-private partnership. Now, in this session, we will hear a sovereign's perspective on the use of CDRFI solutions. We will also hear from public sector and insurance industry leaders from their experience in looking to scale up the use of these tools. Again, a complex topic, but we've learned earlier, be patient with complexity from uh, Professor Banerjee's book. So let's be patient. And I'm sure this is going to be a great panel. It'll be steered by Ms. Claudia Tume from AXA X and she is going to welcome Mr. Hector Santana Suarez, Head of Insurance, Pensions and Social Security Unit at the Ministry of Finance Mexico, Ms. Annette Detkin, Head of Insular Resilience Solutions Fund, and uh, Mr. Denis Duverne, Chairman of AXA and the Insurance Development Forum. A great panel again. And Claudia, it's over to you. Thank you, Monica. And Good morning, buenos dias, uh, Latino America. Good afternoon uh, to everyone in the audience. Welcome, Annette, uh, Hector, and Denis. Um, we first have a request for you in the audience. We would love to know where you are joining us from. And to do this, if you could please look on your screens, if you are um, on a, um, for the word, word cloud, you will see on your screens the words word cloud. If you're on a desktop, it should be located on the right of the screen. If you're on a tablet or a phone, it would be on the bottom. If you click on it and please tell us which country you're joining us towards the end of the session, our technical team will, will show us um, where you're coming from. And now to the topic of this session, we'll try to um, gain some time, but just a short introduction. Since the 1980s, the number of extreme weather events has tripled contributing to an eightfold, incre eightfold increase in property destruction, and this is counting only the amount that is insured. The protection gap, that is the difference between the total economic losses suffered in a period and the insured losses, remains extremely high. The 2020 natural catastrophe events caused a total global economic loss of 190 million, sorry, in 190 billion US dollars, of which 89 were insured, of course, leaving an incredible 101 billion US dollars of uninsured losses. And the majority of those uninsured losses are in developing countries where insurance penetration is low, sometimes under 1%. And at the same time, coastal flooding is projected to rise by 50% by the end of the century, threatening assets worth 20 to 25% of GDP. And over the balance of this century, climate change could cost the equivalent of a decade of no economic growth. But in the short term, climate change continues to have a dramatic impact on vulnerable countries and populations, putting lives and li livelihoods at, at risk. Without prearranged finance in place to respond to crisis, the impact of disaster is amplified. Public assets move, move from being damaged to getting fully destroyed. Many small and medium businesses can fold more live and livelihoods are lost. And all of this, of course, impacting national budgets, increasing sovereign debt levels. As we heard from Administrator Samantha Powell and many others in, in the sessions before, with prearranged finance in place, it's possible to respond faster to crisis for some slow ones and houses like drought, sometimes before they fully set in. Vulnerable people can receive payouts that allow them to better withstand the crisis. Reconstruction of destroyed assets starts more quickly. In fact, a study from Cambridge University showed that for every one increase, 1% uh, 1 increase in insurance penetration, recovery times is reduced by almost a year. So it is against this backdrop that the efforts to scale up use of climate disaster risk finance and insurance, or CDRFI, are taking place. And we're extremely lucky to have leaders representing the private and public sector on our panel today from organizations that are at the center of these efforts. And I'd like to pose the first question to you, Hector. And from your experience, the uh, question is, what are the main benefits that you, that you see in the use of CDRFI tools 
but also what are the challenges that your government faces when considering the use versus investing in competing priorities, whether it's education or health, et cetera, um, and especially after the impact of the COVID pandemic on Mexico's fiscal position. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, let me thank uh, uh, the Insurance Development Forum and Insur Alliance Global Partnership for your kind invitation. It's uh, quite an honor to be with Denis Duvern and Annette Detkin in this uh, round table today. Uh, and thank you as well to you, Claudia, for your support for in this organization process for this uh, session. Uh, for, uh, I would like to give you the to convey the best wishes from the Ministry of uh, the Treasury in Mexico, Rogelio Ramirez de la O, for the success of this uh, forum, this year's forum. Uh, going to your questions, Claudia, well, I, I think that it, it, we have it in, in any government, it's a, always a difficult task how to assign priorities and to allocate resources in, a, in any budget. However, it is clear that uh, for us, the experience of uh, designing and establishing tools that are now well consolidated in uh, to manage our risk for our infrastructure, and especially for the government information infrastructure for health and education has been a very good experience. It's been a good experience based on the fact that with this uh, scheme to manage uh, the, the risks in, in a country like Mexico, which all of you know, it's a country where we have a strong presence of uh, natural events year by year, and uh, we are very vulnerable to some of these uh, events. We have, uh, the, we need to, in case of we have face a, a catastrophe event, we have to do our best effort to get uh, back on, on track as quickly as we can in order to be able to, to, com to comply to our duties as a government, precisely to provide health and education and, of course, communication infrastructure. So for us, the idea to have developed the catastrophic insurance system as a second tier in a third tier system that we have with a cat bond that has now been in place for almost 15 years has been a very uh, good experience. I think you are not competing on priority. You have to take this priority as part of the other priorities, which is how to provide and to guarantee proper educational and health services to our people. Uh, COVID has been a a big, quite a challenge for also our societies. However, our government has managed to uh, protect our the fundamentals of our economy uh, with still low inflation, with uh, uh, debt control and uh, low deficit. And however, we can invest in people in their education and health. So to have this uh, system of insurance so that we can uh, improve our how we allocate resources and also how we manage the, the risk, how to decide uh, and con keep costs under control. It's better to know that if you invest some money to protect your infrastructure, you will save much uh, higher sums and more importantly, you will help people to give them the, the need they, they require at an emergency circumstance uh, much quicker. So that's, that's for us, that's been an, an outstanding uh, exercise. We are very happy. In fact, now we are reorganizing the first level of, of attention at the very at community level, which is a, a first reaction activities that uh, take place just after uh, any catastrophe, a, a hurricane or a earthquake. And then we have uh, consolidated this uh, insurance, uh, uh, cat insurance, and obviously the catastrophe bond that we are very proud of because it has, as I was telling you, helping us to organize and to optimize the resources to protect our uh, infrastructure. And finally, I would add, only add that uh, it is also a, a good uh, experience for us because uh, clearly one of the main uh, difficulties we have is that in some areas we have repeating events year after year 
uh, and uh, we have now introduced some incentives so that you relocate people in that has been affected and give them better sec security areas to live to reduce the risk they are exposed to. And that has to be linked necessarily with climate change and the events that we are in, in taking uh, control of in order to, quite frankly, keep a better eye on our planet. Now, that's the idea behind the, the Paris Agreement and clearly Kyoto. And probably next week, we are going to be very busy in, in Glasgow with the, all these COP26 activities, which we are looking very forward, very interested, because obviously all climate changes, all these effects that have an adverse uh, uh, in, if, if I have an adverse effect on, on our on our infrastructure, we have to look at and we have to, to go to the root. It's important to manage risk, but clearly, always, it is better to reduce that risk. Thank you very much, Hector. Really valuable insights uh, from your experience in Mexico. Uh, I love what you said about, you know, it's not a competing priority, make it a priority. But also your reference to the fact that, you know, um, use of CDRFI tools is, is one of the levers and, and other measures like relocating people, of course, uh, have to be considered. Thank you for that. Um, with that, I will move on now to you, Denis. Um, as the chair of the Insurance Development Forum, uh, you're leading, or the IDF is leading the tripartite program with UNDP um, and also co-financed by uh, BMZ, um, which is focused on scaling up so uh, use of so uh, sovereign use of CDRFS solutions. And so the question is, how, in your view, how can insurers best leverage their insurance expertise, technology, and risk capital to facilitate greater use of CDRFI by sovereigns to address climate and related risks? Uh, thank you, Claudia, and uh, thank you, Hector, uh, for your kind words. Uh, looking forward to uh, meeting you in person. So uh, I think uh, the answer to your question, uh, Claudia, uh, is uh, uh, public-private partnerships uh, are key. Uh, and I'd like to focus on two topics. Without a doubt, accelerating greater risk understanding where the need is greatest is a foundational pillar to enable adaptation and resilience to climate risks through the use of tools like CDRFI. Today, we have the paradox that most uh, investment in risk understanding, risk modeling is in the North, uh, where uh, while uh, a large part of the risk, climate risk are uh, in the global South. Up to now, when a country in the South uh, chooses to use risk financing tools, they are provided by actors uh, from the global North and uh, those tools are uh, most often those models are not uh, reusable. Uh, so the data and risk analytics uh, are staying uh, in the north. So this needs to change. Our industry uh, through the Insurance Development Forum uh, is committing funds, technology and expertise to drive this change. At COP26, we will be announcing uh, two major programs uh, to provide greater access to climate risk information, tools and standards to public sector actors as well as the humanitarian sector. Mm -hmm. Importantly, they will en encourage and enable open access to uh, models and data for public good, common data standards, which encourage uh, the behaviors of sharing across governments, the government departments and sectors, provision of tools enabling countries to own the analysis and develop it further auto autonomously, and availability of private sector risk management knowledge and experience. So I, I'm, I'm confident that this will be a major step forward. We will need uh, further uh, financing for that, uh, but uh, it's built in a public-private partnership and uh, it will benefit uh, the uh, uh, most vulnerable countries. Uh, second, the way to leverage our industry expertise, innovation and risk capital is clearly uh, to drive more partnerships uh, and the tripartite, as you said, is a very good example of that. Our industry teams uh, provide risk knowledge to develop the risk models, the products and programs that respond to the specific needs of the country, uh, region or city that will benefit from a project. UNDP uh, provides uh, the uh, technical development assistance in relation to governance and regulation, and overall looks to put risk at the center of the governance financial planning. They also pro uh, provide uh, easier access to key government uh, actors 
which is extremely helpful and it is a key element that UNDP effectively brings to the tripartite. And the Ensure Resilience Solutions Fund, uh, which uh, Annette leads, not only funds 50% of the value of the projects, but also provides valuable operational support to the development of the concepts and agreements that uh, lay the foundation to execute uh, the projects. So uh, I think those two uh, elements uh, are, are really a demonstration that uh, the insurance industry can bring a lot. Uh, I can talk further about uh, the tripartite, but uh, I would be happy to answer uh, further questions on that topic. Thank you. Thank you, Denis. Important announcements to come clearly there. Um, staying with actually the, the practice of, of driving use of CDRFI, uh, I'd like to come to you, Annette, and since you lead the Insure Resilient Solutions Fund, or ISF, uh, which is one of the vehicles to which Germany provides co-funding for the development of CDRFI solutions for developing nations. Um, the question is, in selecting projects which uh, your organization funds, how does the ISF balance, on the one hand, the need to deliver solutions quickly as the climate continues to change, and we're all very aware of that, with the need to ensure that these projects need to be sustainable, that appropriate governance is in place, that um, especially in countries where often an enabling framework still needs to be developed, it's not quite there in place. How do you address that, Annette? Well, thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank actually uh, uh, being invited to this uh, very interesting panel and uh, having the honor to be here with Dennis Verne and Hector Santana. Um, but you have actually raised a very challenging question, um, the challenge that we're facing with each and every proposal that we're assessing and that uh, is submitted to the ISF. So let me focus on three aspects of our assessment process and also of the ISF approach in order to make it uh, better, uh, um, easier for us, also for the audience to understand the ISF approach. Well, um, there are a set of criteria and uh, minimum criteria that have to be fulfilled in order to have access to ISF support and I just would like to highlight um, the most critical, which I think are essential to assess the sustainable, um, sustainability of a product. So my first um, message here, an aspect that I would like to highlight is that we don't want to compromise on sustainability for the sake of speed. And how do we do this? How do we assess that? Well, first of all, ISF is co-funding product development only if the application is actually submitted by a joint partnership between the demand side and the supply side, meaning that the client, the potential client is involved in the product development already at a very early stage and therefore reflecting the needs um, in the local context. But also having the supply side, the insurance industry involved, means that we make sure that the technical feasibility, but also the financial viability and sustainability are insured. That brings me to the second criteria that I would like to highlight is here that we request a 50% own contribution by the partnership. Therefore, um, the partners are actually asked to invest themselves in the product development and therefore their interest is aligned to eventually develop a product that is, uh, uh, you know, on the long term sustainable. Third, actually, is that this product should be embedded in a wider risk management strategy, meaning that also complementary risk prevention and risk reduction activities should be ongoing or already in place in order to re reduce the risk and therefore also the potential future premium, therefore making insurance less costly and more sustainable. And I think the tripartite agreement is here a very good example of how public-private partnership works where UNDP actually is active in providing um, support to strengthen capacities and um, the general climate risk management uh, capacities in the countries um, that support then also the insurance um, solution in the long term. This brings me actually to the second aspect that I wanted to highlight, and that is that the 
need of urgency is not something that we're not aware of, right? We, um, the ISF approach is actually addressing this need with respect that we are asking for advanced concepts. And we've heard about the plummeting aspect uh, in the earlier um, interventions. So we really want to have the whole spectrum of the product being developed, not only risk modeling and data and the product design, but also the distribution and payout mechanism that eventually um, uh, ensure that there is an impact with the end client and end beneficiary. That means that the partnership should actually demonstrate that the product can be developed and placed on the market within 24 months after um, the funding from ISF is approved. And that requires that the partners involved are experienced. And here, our cooperation with the private sector, I think, is key a key success factor because the insurance industry has the experience and the know-how how to design uh, an insurance product um, such that it's technically feasible and, as mentioned, also financially viable. The last aspect is that ISF itself, we try to be part of the solution. So the grants that we can support with the funding of um, BMZ, actually, we try to be an ingredient to gain speed. So rendering new products um, actually feasible that would not otherwise have been realized. So that are the actually three aspects that I would like to highlight here. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Annette. And I'm sure that that will be very helpful uh, for applicants or maybe some uh, friends out there that are considering um, starting a project um, of which ISF could be a, a co-founder. Co -founder. Thank you very much. Um, I would like then now to move back to you, Hector, and ask you about from the point of view of the country, what are the key elements that can facilitate uh, access and adoption to CDRFI tools um, so that they can be scaled up? I mean, Mexico has a tremendous history of, of use, working with these tools, um, but for other countries, it's, it's newer. Uh, what facilitates actually starting and, and, and expanding the use of this type of tools? Well, I think that uh, in you are absolutely right. Mexico has had now some experience, and I'd say a very good experience in how developing and handling all these uh, insurance tools. But let me tell you that uh, I think that we have to work together to enhance uh, awareness of risk. Well, I think that's one of the main issues uh, ahead of us, how people in, and governments in other areas have to face the, the difficult task that you asked me in the in previous question, but how to choose between priorities. And as well, uh, that's why I would go back to say, you don't choose between these priorities, it's part of these uh, essential priorities for the country. I think that it is essential that we build on the idea that an adequate risk management is just a sensible policy. Risk management improves uh, planning tools for designing, implementing public policy, and also to run budgets and, and run, run the budget uh, properly. So, it, because it helps to organize your funds, how you allocate the resources. Uh, of course, cooperation is essential, and there are now many aspects that will reduce the impact for newcomers to the world of uh, catastrophe insurance. And I think that, first of all, we have now uh, the opportunity to provide technical assistance uh, to work on and, and build on the best practices and also to learn from not such a fortunate experience that we all have faced in developing this kind of uh, tools. Uh, I would say it, it is very useful to have a um, uh, to map your risk as a country, to have a clear idea of your vulnerabilities, and uh, to put some decision in 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 in, in practice so that uh, you reduce that uh, that risk. So I, I think it makes sense. I think it's a, it's it's a good business for the government, but more importantly, is uh, a very good uh, business for the people of the country because as it, it protects and gives a better and speedier. Uh, response from the government. We have in Mexico a recent experience, very successful one, of international cooperation precisely 
uh, based on the cat bond that we have been developing since 2006. In 2018, we, uh, together with Chile, Colombia, and Peru, within the realm of the Pacific Alliance, we had uh, developed a, a catastrophic bond, a catastrophic bond, Probably it's uh, over $1,400 million, but it, it, it builds on the experience, Mexican experience that I were with our catastrophe bond basically was to protect us from earthquakes and hurricanes. And when we have developed uh, two different um, triggers for this uh, uh, parametric uh, bond in order to, two different triggers for for earthquakes and also one for hurricanes coming from the Pacific and one from the Gulf of Mexico. So we don't, with this, we share this experience and with the, the with Chile, Colombia, and Peru, and we have developed this uh, uh, regional uh, cat cat one, which I found it's uh, also a very good experience and it's working well. And we are looking forward to enhance the scope and uh, the membership of this international effort. So I think uh, that's what we can always do. And of course, Mexico is always willing to share our experience and in a frank and uh, direct way so that we can have a, a better protected society, not only in our country, but all, all over the world. Paul, thank you, Hector, for those comments. And of course, an excellent example. In fact, that cat bond, I understand, has already delivered uh, payouts both in Mexico and in Peru. Um, so it, it shows that uh, the difference that it makes ultimately to populations, as you say. Um, thank you for that. And talking about adoption of CDRFI tools, um, coming back to you, Denis, the tripartite program is something we've mentioned a few times. Can you tell us a bit more about it? How has it progressed? And through that program, what do you see are necessary elements to make to make it successful, to make other similar programs successful? Um, tell us a little bit more about that, please. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Uh, as you know, the tripartite program was launched uh, just over two years ago uh, at, the, uh, at the UN in uh, September 2019. And uh, we have a commitment to uh, provide uh, uh, both uh, risk, uh, I mean, technical assistance and risk financing to uh, 20 countries by 2025. So we have in total only six years and already two years have elapsed. So there is clearly a sense of urgency uh, on the part of the three uh, partners, uh, BMZ, the Insurance Development Forum, uh, and the UNDP. The program is progressing well. Uh, uh, first, the engagement of uh, the members of the IDF is very strong. We have uh, uh, more than 70 uh, in, uh, risk experts from 11 companies uh, that are uh, participating in the program at this point. Uh, we have projects ongoing for 17 different countries across Africa, Latin America, and uh, Asia. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a substantial, uh, substantial uh, undertaking for the, for the industry. Uh, the UNDP teams are also engaged with uh, uh, already 14 countries, uh, and uh, we have two uh, tripartite projects already in execution, uh, one uh, in Peru for public schools and one uh, uh, for the city of Medellin, Colombia. In addition, uh, we have six country teams that have uh, governments committed to execute projects together, and about seven of the teams uh, exploring options with the government partners to agree on a specific uh, project. Uh, but uh, your question is what helps drive success? Uh, I mentioned already the sense of urgency, uh, and this cannot uh, be emphasized enough. Uh, clearly, uh, a, a partnership where uh, each party uh, uh, delivers what, uh, what is expected uh, from, uh, from them. And otherwise, uh, I mean, the, uh, we, uh, we uh, believe that uh, we are uh, uh, well uh, on track with this sense of urgency, the commitment of uh, of the three parties and the uh, uh, technical uh, assistance uh, coming from the uh, industry members. We are uh, looking to uh, uh, enable more developing countries to better manage their risk and have access to uh, greater protection. Uh, in doing so, we are looking to expand local insurance markets and quite often finding local insurers and working together with the uh, uh, country uh, insurance association is, uh, is essential. Uh, some projects may fail, uh, but uh, and, and also we are 
uh, also some projects may be delayed because there is a change in the uh, uh, in the uh, government, which is some, something that happens. But uh, we believe that uh, uh, the, the program is working well. Another element is to uh, uh, bring uh, innovation. Uh, and Annette mentioned uh, uh, the, 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 the issue, a very important issue of distribution and uh, ability to pay the claims to the uh, uh, to the final beneficiaries. Those are very uh, critical elements uh, in emerging markets. Uh, and uh, so uh, we have to be innovative there. But thanks to the use of uh, new technologies, satellite Im imagery, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we are uh, we have now several programs where we have found ways to uh, uh, so that uh, the claim handling is uh, automatized, automated, and uh, and we are uh, spending less on distribution, uh, so that uh, the loss adjustment is done through parametric methods, as uh, the ones. Uh, mentioned by Hector, and uh, we uh, are capable of uh, delivering uh, the, the, the claims benefits to the uh, uh, end beneficiary in a very timely manner. So I believe all in all the program is working uh, well, uh, but we have again a sense of urgency on the part of the three uh, partners of the tripartite so that we achieve the, uh, the coverage of the 20 countries by 2025, knowing that the uh, 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 insurance members of the IDF have committed to provide five billion US dollars of uh, risk capital to the equation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Denis. Um, very good point. Sense of urgency and, and innovation, and I think sense of urgency is something that is is being felt very strongly as as we all uh, move and, and plan towards COP twenty six next week. Um, in the interest of time, I will move now also to um, to Hector back again. Just quickly, Hector, and connecting with these comments from Denis, because uh, you have a, a team from, from IDF uh, working with your unit, uh, putting together a project uh, for Mexico uh, to expand use of CDRFI, and, and I understand it's also uh, applying for, for this co-funding for the tripartite. Can you tell us a little bit more about that project? Well, yes, of course. I'm glad that you mentioned it. it, it I think it's a very good project. It's a project in fairness, in inclusion, and, uh, and into a, a good risk management effort. It, it is a parametric uh, insurance devoted to protect farmers, low-income farmers in Mexico. It, in the pilot is going to be uh, 10,000 farmers in three states in South Mexico, three of the uh, poorest and, and more uh, uh, vulnerable states in our country, which are, are Guerrero, uh, Oaxaca, and Chiapas. And it is uh, basically a parametric, a parametric insurance that we aim to use to protect small farmers with on their five hectares, which is, you know, like 12 and a half uh, acres uh, of, of, of plots of land smaller than that, that produce corn, which is a, the basic staple for Mexico. And it, and it is even more important for people that are in low income uh, bracket of, of the society. So it's an effort to uh, preserve their, their, their patrimonium, their, their, their resources, to, to preserve their livelihood in time of a in case of a disaster. So we are, we are looking forward for this project. I think it's a, a very good idea. We hope it, it also needs not, it, that we get the funds so that we can uh, start the pilot uh, as quickly as possible. And we are confident that it's going to be a successful experience that we might introduce in a bigger project uh, in the years to come. We need to protect those that are much more vulnerable than the others. And obviously, we're very glad with this international effort. I'm looking forward to improve it and consolidate on the work already done. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Hector. And a really uh, relevant uh, example, really, about social protection ultimately for the most for the most vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. So that's 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 really good to hear. Um, Annette, I would like to come back to you and um, really in terms of what is being done already, there's a lot of efforts underway, there's much more work to do. So given all this, 
Um, do you feel optimistic about seeing an expansion in the use of CDRFI tools in developing countries? And if so, why? Or why not? Oh, yeah. uh, well, um, by nature, I'm optimistic, uh, but also with respect to the use of uh, <clears throat> CDRFI uh, in the future, I am very confident that it will be much more common. And why should we expect so? Actually, first, I think with the increase in frequency and the intensity of extreme weather events, the awareness is rising also um, in developing countries that uh, the risks they're facing with climate change. Second is that the countries um, more and more uh, are better to understand the risks given also the support and the tools and data that is provided by the insurance industry that help them to understand the risk. And both of these conditions actually are um, an essential element in order to use and then apply climate disaster risk finance and insurance further. There is a third actually argument, and that is that we see an increasing number of applications to the Insurance Area and Solutions Fund and, con and consequently also more projects being approved. And I would actually like to take this opportunity today for the good news that our technical committee, just as of last week, <clears throat> has approved the third project under the tripartite agreement, and that is the project in Mexico. So. Oh, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, we're very glad. <laughs> yeah, we are very, very glad also from our side. And uh, we will award co funding, therefore, for the um, uh, project that the actor has just explained uh, very well here. Um, and uh, we congratulate the partnership and we're looking forward to work together with you over the next two years. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's that's live news right here. Congratulations, Hector, and also to the team. I imagine that maybe some of the uh, my colleagues, our colleagues, uh, may be watching us. So congratulations on that, Hector. I, I will let you comment first. Well, I'm just delighted, really. We we are, we're looking forward to this effort. We have been working for quite some time in de developing the project. So I, I'm absolutely confident that we it's going to be a very good experience. I would like to thank Annette for this delivering such a good news and also to the need for the continued support for this project that he has uh, clearly backed since day one. So we hope that in the next year forum we will give some good news on the success of the first stage of the pilot program. Thank you, Claudia. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Hector. That, that is really, really great news uh, to hear that we'll have one more project going into execution very soon. Um, we started a little bit late, so I, I will have also one last question for you, Denis, which is the same one I had asked Annette before. Uh, from your point of view, and particularly with this tremendous effort that the IDF is, is driving, but aware of all the work that there is still to do, do you feel optimistic about expanding um, the use of CDRFI solutions in developing uh, nations? Well, Claudia, like Annette, I am, a, I am an optimist by nature. Uh, I, I would add that uh, the uh, experience that we've had uh, with the tripartite has been an, an experience where the mutual trust between the three partners, uh, BMZ, uh, the UNDP, uh, uh, the insurance uh, industry, and I would say the four partners, the local governments, has increased tremendously. I, I think we are seen as uh, a very uh, a credible and trustworthy uh, partners uh, uh, by, by each other, which is, uh, which is key to build uh, success. And secondly, I would say also that uh, uh, at the uh, multilateral level, at the global level, uh, G7, and so on, the, the, the issue of uh, ex ante financing for future natural catastrophes versus exposed financing uh, after the catastrophe is gaining uh, steam. Yesterday, uh, the, uh, the high level uh, consultative group of the uh, Insurance Union's Global Partnership approved the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, I would say, the template for uh, smart uh, premium financing. Uh, all of that, I think, is pointing uh, in the same direction, and therefore I am really optimistic about uh, the progress that we are making on uh, ex-ante financing, uh, risk prevention, risk analysis, uh, and uh, uh, insurance protection, uh, which will uh, improve the way we deal with natural catastrophes in emerging markets.
Excellent. Thank you, Denis. So um, summarize, I will summarize next, but I will ask the technical team before I do that just very quickly to show us where our audience came from today. If maybe they, you could put that image up there if it's available. But maybe as they look for that, I'm not seeing it come up yet. Um, we heard in the session really today about, um, first of all, the importance from Hector about thinking that the use of these tools is not a competing priority, but it is a priority and it is a priority that, that supports all the other uh, focus that a government will have, whether it's health or education, because it is about protecting uh, people. And we heard from Hector, from Denis, but also from Annette about the importance of access to risk understanding and expanding awareness of risk. Um, Hector, you talked about mapping risk, the importance of partnership, uh, and, and at the same time of enabling local ownership, right? Uh, Annette highlighted that very much. It needs to be part of, of the projects that governments and, and uh, local experts participate in shaping uh, what the solution will be. Uh, but also about ownership of all that risk data and risk understanding. Um, we also heard from the knee about having a sense of urgency. I think this is something everybody can relate to uh, about that being an element that helps to to make uh, programs successful, to move forward quickly with a, with a sense of focus, but also at the same time driving innovation and relying on technology that can help uh, particularly in developing countries to address some local challenges and make programs more effective. And uh, very much like mentioned from Hector about the issue of inclusion, right? About how these tools are not only about um, restoring damaged property, but it is also, they are also about social protection um, um, ultimately. And Glad to hear that uh, our experts here are optimistic uh, about the future and about um, about really expanding the use of these tools that can truly make a difference in addressing um, the impacts of climate change. Um, I'm asking the insurance insure resilience team whether we can. Oh, there we have the word cloud. Uh, we have a lot of friends from Germany, of course, uh, and I cannot see it very well, so I hope that you can, because I'm seeing it a little bit smaller than probably all of you. Um, but hopefully a lot of people from, clearly there's, there's a lot of countries that join us today. So thank you for being with us. Uh, with that, I will um, pass on, I think, back to Monica. And thank you very much, Annette, Denis, and Hector for being on this panel today and for sharing your insights. It is my insight. pleasure. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. 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 Well, thank you so much, Claudia, and of course, the entire panel. Again, a really great, very inspiring session there. And I have to say, we're three hours into day one, and I said right at the beginning, it's densely packed program. It's a lot to take in, right? Well, this is why we thought a very, very short break would be good right now. But because we want you to be fit. Uh, we still have a lot coming up. We have an interactive game session. We have the regional sessions uh, from Africa and Latin America. And last but not least, a leaders dialogue. Very interesting one, of course, to close the day. But first of all, short break, five minutes, not more, where you can actually relax or exchange views with your fellow participants in the networking room. Please leave the streaming website open so you don't miss Pablo Suarez when he's taking over with his interactive session in less than five minutes. Stay tuned and see you later. <laughs>